All right. Welcome back to Empty the Bench. This is an interview special that we do from time to time, and we bring on some great guests. And actually, Tom, we've done a lot about the sports media, right? Yes. So I listen to this next guest's podcast. I happen to like it a lot. And he does a column called Train of Thoughts. I just got done reading that one. And he also does the SI Sports Media podcast. Uh, Jimmy Trainer, Jimmy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's get right to the crux. Uh, Tom and I grew up watching the traditional ESPN in the 90s and early 2000s. Now we're seeing ESPN going through the layoff phase. We saw it at the beginning of the pandemic. And now we're hearing names moving all over the place. The latest rumor is Neil Everett might be out at Sports Center. Um, what do you make of all the moves at ESPN? Are they getting rid of names because they're going away from personality driven or are they just doing it for money purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of issues. I think it's a little bit of a market correction. I think the new regime, Jimmy Pataro, who's the president, um, inherited all these big contracts from the last regime and, and John Skipper. And, you know, the traditional sports center doesn't, um, isn't what it was in terms of viewership because of streaming and, and social media and the way we consume news differently. So I think there's a little bit of a market correction going on, just trying to say, hey, you know, we're not paying sports center anchors this kind of money. Obviously, the Van Pelt situation is different. That it's really not Sports Center; it's really the Scott Van Pelt show. Um, <clears throat> so you have that going on. You know, I'm sure you know ESPN took a hit during the pandemic when we had three months of no sports. Maybe that's a factor here a little bit, um, and just you know, it's about saving money. I think you know, cost cutting, and then you know, there's going to be ESPN is going to put a lot of their resources into ESPN Plus like every company going to streaming. So kind of a lot of layers to it. So now to specifically get into, you know, a different number of specific people at ESPN who have recently left, obviously probably the biggest one as of late is Kenny Main, the longtime sports center anchor. Do you think ESPN generally wanted to keep him and renegotiate his salary or was his leaving just an inevitability? Yeah, listen, they asked him reportedly to take a 61% pay cut. When you do that, you're basically saying, thanks for coming, but it's time to move on. So again, he was making good money, you know, over a million or whatever. 61% though is pretty drastic. I just think, I just think they didn't want him. And that one's a little tough because you'd like to think, there would be some, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, some cachet there that for him being there so long and being one of the old guard, but sentimentality doesn't really have a chance against money. So they asked him to take the 61% pay cut. He says no, and he's no longer with the company. I mean, keeping it to the personality part of the company. Uh, I heard you talking to uh, Stu Gatz. You did an interview with him in your uh last uh, episode and you were talking about uh levitard and uh what they their 24-hour extravaganza with free dom and i think it's interesting that levitard kind of separated there was a political issue there was a there was other issues what do you make of that situation and were they was it inevitable that just they didn't fit there anymore or was there ever a chance that maybe it could have been fixed in any way no i think it was inevitable it was always a weird marriage um it, the levitar show didn't seem to get the sort of um push that other espn shows and personalities got and i think the show was maybe a little too out there for espn it's not a hot take show it's not a debate show that's what ESPN loves. Uh, once, I mean, I had written this. Once they had that incident where um, Donald Trump said at a rally, go back to where you came from. And then Dan talked about that the next morning as the son of parents who immigrated from Cuba. And ESPN basically gave him a slap on the wrist for it. And there were meetings. Once that happened, I, I knew that relationship was doomed because for him to get in trouble for that is absurd. 
Then they cut his show. I, I know they moved the show from, <clears throat> I don't know the logistics of the television side of it, but it was from ESPN U, ESPN Radio, I don't know. And to the plus. So yeah. you just, you saw the writing on the wall. And then as Stu Gatz told me on, on my SI Media pod, once ESPN decided to lay off uh, Chris Cody from the show, that was sort of the, the straw that broke the camel's back for Dan Levitard. I just want to follow up the money that they got from DraftKings. I'm sure that kind of went a long way to saying, let's do our own content. I know that uh, Levitard eventually went back with Skipper. There was kind of pretentious relationship with him and ESPN. They was Skipper kind of the, I don't know, would you say kind of defended Dan as the only guy yeah. that uh, accepted yeah. his content? Yeah. Skip, I mean, Skipper was a Levitard guy and once Skipper left, um, that's when things sort of deteriorated between Levitard and ESPN. Now, moving on to one other name who actually just recently left ESPN as well. I believe the day we're actually recording this is his last day at ESPN. And that's Ariel Helwani came to ESPN in 2018 around the time where uh, ESPN got the rights to the UFC. And now after three years, three successful years, it seems that this is the end with how successful the focus of MMA has been on for ESPN is the decision for him to part ways with ESPN surprising. And on top of that, he's going to the action network on a one-year deal. It's not exclusive. So he can go say, Oh, back to SB nation or back to Fox sports. Uh, but is it still surprising that he's joining the action network considering he's more of a interviews personality. He's not really about the betting odds of the side of things yeah i mean you hit it everything about this was strange like to me this was a more surprising departure than kenny main you know kenny main's an older guy he's been there forever he's on sports center which like we said doesn't have the cachet once did whereas with ariel like I, I was you know he fits perfectly in espn i mean they air ufc they air mma he's the top reporter for that um sport uh, that one surprised me. Again, he was a guy, I guess, making a lot of money and ESPN's trying to trim salary. But, uh, you know, I'm surprised they let him go. I was surprised he went to the Action Network. I thought he'd um, maybe go to a more traditional place. You know, I don't, I don't follow MMA, UFC, whatever it is. So I, I don't know the, you know, the ins and outs of it, but I would think he would be great at a company that had no ties to MMA. So I guess Action Sports fits that. Because I know he's had some issues with Dana White. So, you know, if he goes and works for a company that is partners with Dana White, it's tough for him. So I could see him trying to, you know, not get associated with a company that's in bed with UFC. But I was surprised it would be Action Sports Network, to be honest with you. Talking to Jimmy Trainer of Sports Illustrated. Jimmy, uh, over the past few years, We've seen sports betting companies, speaking of DraftKings, have an increased presence within the sports media itself. How do you think it's going to uh, – moves like this with the act, Ariel joining the Action Network, how do you think it's going to affect those outlets? And could these kinds of moves be damaging to, say, the human element interviews and feature stories we see on, say, 30 for 30 or E60? I don't think it'll be damaged. Listen, you're always going to have people who do that stuff. I, I don't think that's going to be a factor. Um what was the first part of your question? I mean, listen, it's a great move for the Action Sports Network. Uh, you know, if I don't know what their goal is with Ariel, is it to have him focus on sort of the betting angles with the MMA, or is it um, to have him still do news? I think there's a lot of value in him still being a news person, doing interviews, breaking stories. That'll only help Action Sports Network. I don't know what the plan is, though, for him over there. This is all, you know, kind of new. I mean, moving over to more of the plus platforms, because that seems to be the hot topic of the month. I mean, Tom and I were discussing that Grubhub all of a sudden now has a plus app. Everything has a plus app now, it seems like. So what do you make of the future of potential online plus platforms as opposed to traditional TV? Would you would you rather just be able to say I can take my remote press a button and watch TV? Or do you think that this is the way we're going with plus apps? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad this is all happening on the, you know, after my peak of sports fandom, because I would have hated this 
when I was a diehard watch every sport kind of guy, because it's just so fractured and you need to have subscriptions to so many different apps and, and, and streaming services. So I'm not a fan of it. I hate it. Um, but this is the way it's going to be. I mean, people under 30 don't even know what cable is, but yeah, I much prefer watching things on TV with cable than streaming, but that well, whether I like that or not is irrelevant. The, everything is about streaming and, and, and niche um, products. And just to follow up on that, just obviously the new TV rights for some of these leagues, like say the NFL, they're starting to come into place here, but how are these plus platforms and all these different streaming outlets going to affect the future of broadcasting rights, especially when they, it seems like these days, and especially maybe more so for the MLB, mean just as much, if not more, than, say, the live game. Yeah, I mean, the biggest one we've seen recently is the NHL. The NHL is putting – they're going to put a ton of games exclusively on ESPN Plus once they, got that, once they get that contract. And that means this. Even in your local market, I mean, if you live in Boston and there's a Bruins game that's on ESPN Plus, you're not getting that on the local Boston, Nesson, or wherever it is. You have to watch it on ESPN Plus. So in hockey, it's going to be a big deal. The NFL is still on traditional television. I think that's going to stay that way for a while. I mean, the contract was lengthy, so you're still going to have your – the NFL is still all about CBS, Fox, and, and ABC, although they're going to have Thursday night on Amazon. So even they're sort of, you know – but that's only one game a week. Um, you know, MLB, again, everything there is with, you know, their app, MLB TV – can't get games really, you know, I know there was a lot of issues with they, they're all, the Yankees used to be on YouTube TV. Now they're not, they used to be on Hulu. Now they're not. So they're sort of condensing all that. So again, it's, it's, uh, if you, if you're a sports fan who likes every sport, and I'm, I'm kind of like an, a football, baseball, basketball guy, and that's it. But if you like, if you like hockey and soccer and MMA and, you have to subscribe to like a billion things. So, and it's only going to get worse. And to stay with uh, the NFL for a second, we have the Sunday tickets. Now the contract exclusivity with DirecTV is coming up at the end of 2021. Do you foresee a streaming platform like the Plus or Amazon Prime maybe taking away that exclusivity or even to the point where could we see the NFL maybe spin the Sunday ticket off into its own streaming plan? It's funny, but all these TV deals, that's the one everyone wants to know about the most is the Sunday ticket <laughs> by far and away. I, I don't think it's up till after 2022, um, which really sucks. But I, listen, it's a far way off. So who knows who gets involved? I mean, Apple has all the money they, they can get. But I would assume, I mean, we see NBC has been so aggressive with Peacock. My assumption is ESPN plus is going to be a major player for it that could be part of why they're trying to trim all this money um so uh, that's going to be a free-for-all i don't know who gets it but you know the days of direct tv having it will be over after 2022 now actually before i ask my next i want to follow up as you mentioned nhl is going to espn and we're seeing espn now has the M- they already had the nba rights they have mlb rights they're now going to have nhl rights are is this an excuse kind of for ESPN to say we can cut our personalities because we're paying more for sports rights? Or is that just the way the networks are going? I, it's, I think, listen, you need, you know, you're ESPN and you have, you know, a billion channels. You need to fill, fill those channels with content. There's still, there's nothing out there in terms of content that's better, that's better than live sports. So they're going to want to be involved with all the leagues like they are. They've got contracts with everything. I mean, that's their bread and butter. But listen, they got to fill tons of hours when there's no sports on during the day. So that's where you get your Stephen A. Smiths and, you know, the other day, Get Up, Mike Greenberg. So I think they'll always have that. They need that for, for daytime. Um, and there's other, basically, areas where they're trimming. So I, I, I think, yeah, I don't see that changing. All right. Now to go to more of a social media digital part of this, which is, I don't know if you heard the YouTubers versus TikTok fights that were on with, uh, I don't know, because Tom covers them for uh, Fansided. But 
what did you think of this whole YouTubers versus TikTokers uh, boxing event? Did you follow that at all or what that was about? Well, for that. I mean, let me just say this. I actually love TikTok, but in terms of like knowing, I wouldn't know Josh Richards from Bryce Hall. Like if they fell on me, I don't know who's who. So yeah, I don't know. Who was the guy who... Who was the guy in the fight? I mean, you had the whole Mayweather Logan Paul fight, which was the big thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't get why people degrade themselves by paying to watch Logan Paul. But that's just me. I, I'm, I'm old, so. And, and as someone covering the the combat sports, I don't know why either. Yeah. But this is how it is. Uh, talking to Jimmy Trader of Sports Illustrated. Listen to the Sports Illustrated Media podcast. You can read his column, Train of Thoughts. Uh, there's no arguing that these gimmick fights, speaking of, uh, are big money draws. They'll big bring big money for the promoters, the athletes, all the stars who partake. But do you think, you know, is this freak show, sideshow kind of thing going to be the norm for the combat sports world? And you think it's going to harm, say, the credibility, legacy, and legitimacy of a sport like boxing? I mean, I don't know how personally you can bring the brings new fans to the sport argument when you're not what when you're watching say just logan paul and the paul brothers and you're not watching canelo and anthony joshua tyson fury actual yeah. boxers yeah i mean i i don't think i would consider again i'm the wrong person to discuss this but i wouldn't consider anything involving logan or jake paul boxing so i don't do i do i think it hurts like any credibility at boxing's credibility no because i don't consider it boxing but i do think something should be said about the fact i mean you mentioned this people buy these weirdo fights and they make a ton of money i think it shows you how stupid young people are in this country but that's not <laughs> going to go away i mean if people can make money they're just going to do it more so if whatever that took place the other night with youtube versus tiktok i mean if that made people money they're going to do it again. It's really that simple. It's not rocket science. If it didn't make the money, they wouldn't do it. But I don't, to me, that's separate than boxing. I don't, but that's the way I look at it. I don't know how other people feel about it. All right, we'll move away from boxing. We'll talk about a traditional sport of baseball. So we've seen the sticky stuff controversy come out. Now we see breaking news from Jeff Passan of ESPN breaking the whole report that now Basically, we're going to frisk pitchers when they come off the mound uh, with the uh, spider tack, and we're going to find all these weird, uh, sticky stuff. What do you make of this whole controversy? And also, do we need to give Garrett Cole and the Yankees uh, a, a class on PR and how to handle that whole situation? Yeah, I don't know what that, I, I, you know, I, I was surprised he didn't have a prepared answer for that question. Um, what do I make of the whole thing? I, I think it's just highly bizarre that this is all taking place in the middle of the season. I don't know why this wasn't addressed and sort of taken care of before the season, because it, apparently everyone knows this has been going on for a couple of years now. So it's weird to me that in the middle of the season is when this would, you know, happen. Um, listen, if you, you know, I had Evan Longoria on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he basically said every pitcher uses something. Now, I don't know the percentage of pitchers using sticky tack, but I would imagine it's pretty significant. So I could see a lot of pitchers thinking, okay, well, I'll use this. And if I get caught, I get caught. It's only a 10-day suspension, which for a pitcher is two starts. And they get paid during their 10-day suspension. So is that a deterrent? I'm not sure, but... Um, I, you know, I, I guess this is all too in sort of uh, reaction to the fact that there's no hitting anymore in baseball, and that means there's no excitement. So if this will sort of increase excitement and get hitting going and runs again, then, you know, it's good for that's much better for the game than all of these boring games. Now, I want to ask something about Rob Manfred. Now, Tom and our other co-host, Nick, who's not here, I rant a lot about Rob Manfred and the way that he's been handling a lot of the stuff going on in Major League Baseball. Do you really think he's the fit guy to run this sport in the future? You know, it's funny because I know you want me to say no. <laughs> I know a lot of people have, have issues. 
I know a lot of people have issues with Rob Manfred, but like if he at the end of the day gets MLB a new TV deal and they're making, you know, a billion dollars, then the owners are going to think he's more than fit to run the sport. You know, run the sport is a pretty broad thing. I mean, like he, he's there to make the owners money, which we don't care about. And like we get annoyed with, you know, that replay sucks and he won't make it better. So, you know, I do I think he's fit to run the sport? Well, if the sport makes money, yes. Do I think baseball has a lot of problems that could be fixed and he's not addressing them? Sure. Um, so, you know, listen, you never know, too. I mean, you could put – if you you don't know what the next commissioner could I, – I will say this. The seven-inning doubleheaders and, and the man on second to start extra innings, if they fired him – if they got rid of Manfred just based on that, I, I'd be fine with it because I think those are two, <laughs> two things that are just so – absolutely disgusting when it comes to the tradition of baseball so you know again fit to run the game from those kind for those kinds of things no makes money for the league yes so I don't, you know you got to look at it both ways all right i'm satisfied with that answer all right uh final question jimmy uh, a little bit to the nba playoffs yep. uh you Apparently, you've gone on the record saying you think Kevin Harlan should replace the retiring Marv Albert as the voice of national NBA games. Uh, I'm sure Ian Eagle would have a, a word or two to say about that. But uh, do you think Turner Sports will make that choice, or do you think maybe they go to Ian Eagle full time on TNT? What do you make of that situation? You no, know, early on the rep- you know, and for the record, I, I I think Ian should get that job in a few years. I just think Harlan deserves a little bit of a run, given that he's a little older than Ian. Um, a while back, the reports were that, they, that TNT was going to hire Brian Anderson in, for that position, which I would have him peg third if I was, you know, like if it goes to Ian, you can't have any complaints. Ian's phenomenal. Um, but I'd like to see Harlan just get a run, you know, because he deserves it. And, you know, it would be great to have the country, you know, understand why he's so great as he calls like, a, you know, an Eastern or Western Conference final. I don't know what they're going to do. I think, you know, from what Andrew Martian reports to the New York Post, they've sort of backed off the Brian Anderson thing. And, um, you know, I think Ian may have a tough deal because he does the Nets during the regular season, whereas Kevin, I don't think, does any NBA uh, local team. So maybe they give Harlan – I'm hoping they just give Harlan a little run for, you know, two or three years and then let Ian do it. But – I don't know what direction TNT is thinking about right now. All right, Tom. So we made it through the whole sports media landscape. And uh, Jimmy, thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, check out the SI Sports Media Podcast and Train of Thoughts. And uh, actually, your tweets are really funny, too. I find them fascinating <laughs> as well. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for Jimmy. stopping by, Jimmy. Thanks. Take care.